So then they ran and fetched him thence in verse 23, and when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulder and shoulders and upward. And Samuel now introduces him to the people. Now, chapter 11 and 12, you get some interim uh, storyline, and we're going to jump over to chapter 13 where Saul is newly anointed as the king, and it doesn't take long for him to, to kind of turn away from the king of heaven and stop following that perfect example. So as we transition over into chapter 14, there's a couple of things about how ancient kingship worked among the Israelites and in the ancient world. There are three core things that uh, typically we see for how ancient kingship worked. One, uh, the individual received divine designation as a king. We definitely have that with Saul, where he's appointed by God through Samuel, and he's anointed with the oil. Second, the king is supposed to provide a demonstration to gain public attention and public uh, support. Now, what we notice is in chapter 11 of 1 Samuel, Saul has not yet had a chance to proclaim himself through his deeds, and there's some detractors who don't think he should be the king. In chapter 12, he takes on the enemies, the Ammonites, and wins, and then the people say, okay, clearly he's the king. Then part three is the public confirmation of the new leader. So one and three happen in chapter 11, and chapter 12 is where part two happens. And yet, Saul loses the divine designation because of choices he deliberately made. And we're going to now look at what did Saul do to lose this divine appointment and therefore go off track personally and actually cause problems in the society that he was supposed to be serving. So as we turn over to chapter 14, let's, let's set the stage here for what's about to happen, starting in verse 5. The Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sound which, was, which is on the seashore in multitude. So what you're going to end up with is this group of Philistines over there, a steep hill in between, so you've got the army of Israel over here, you have the Philistines over here, and we have the stage set with the numbers. Now, we understand that in Old Testament and with some translations, there may be some issues of inflated numbers at time, uh, a multiple of ten. So often, if you, if you were to divide by 10, that, that might be a, a roundabout guess as to where probably the more accurate numbers would be in English. Either way, even if you divide by 10, you've still got 3,000 chariots, 600 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude, and they're pitched against the Israelites. Look at verse 6, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits." So what we're going to end up with is thousands of the enemy camped over here. We have – we're going to find out that it's 600, if you look at chapter 14, verse 2, 600 of the soldiers in Saul's army with Jonathan his son, and notice verse 9 says, Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offering. He's not in the tribe of Levi. He's a Benjamite. He's the king. And you could say, well, the king can do anything he wants, but under strict Mosaic law, the king can't just do the priestly functions without the priesthood, and he just did. So Samuel, when he arrives, says to him in verse 13, thou hast done foolishly, Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever." You, you could have had a kingdom forever, Saul, but you weren't obedient. You didn't follow God. So then 15, Samuel arose and got him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin, and Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about six hundred men. So there we go again. You've got about 600 men. They're hiding in the rocks, in the caves, in the trees. They're scattered. 
And what's more, verse 19, there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. So if you want any blacksmith work done, you have to go down to the Philistines because they've taken all of your smiths out of the land of Israel. And verse 22, it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan his son was there found. So you get the king and his son, Jonathan, and their armor bearers who have weapons, but nobody else does of the 600. Are you noticing the astronomical odds against these Israelites at this time? I, f I find it fascinating that of all of the Old Testament heroes that we often talk about, there's often a lot of emphasis put on David because he slew Goliath. This, this young shepherd boy actually took down the giant, and, and we love that story. It just somehow sings to our soul that, that hero's journey that he goes on and, and comes out on top. Can I just suggest to you that I would personally much rather, any day, I would rather have David's odds or David's chance at the battle that he wages with Goliath than I would with Jonathan and his armor-bearer with the battle they're going to wage here in chapter 14. One of the ironies is, is that David, we always love the David and Goliath story, at the end of the story with David, you're, you're going to see some struggles that he has. Ironically, we don't see any, very many struggles at all with Jonathan. He seems to stay faithful down to the very end, and yet he often gets overlooked. And I just have to speak personally here for a minute. He's one of my personal heroes from all scripture study, one of these characters who often gets skipped, often doesn't get his story told, and yet it's quite remarkable. Watch the faith play out, because we, we've spent so much time in this episode talking about the struggle with kings. Well, now watch Jonathan, this son of a king, watch his faith watch his devotion, watch the Christ-like attributes come off of the page as we cover this story in chapter 14. Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, unfortunately we don't have this, this guy's name, someday I can't wait to meet him on the other side of the veil and thank him for his faith and his dedication and, and consecration to the Lord. So Jonathan turns to him. Keep in mind, we're up here, we're totally outnumbered, we're, everybody's just hiding, scared to death, and Jonathan says, come, let us go over to the Philistine, Philistines' garrison that is on the other side, but he told not his father. So Saul has no idea what's going on. And you'll notice that they went down the hill into this valley between the two armies, and it says in verse 4, between the passages, by which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side, and he turns in verse 6 to his young man that bare his armor and said, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Oh, I love those words that he's saying, we don't need to have equal numbers. In fact, it's just you and me compared to those numbers that you got over there in chapter 13 of the King James translation showing 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand of the sea, and we have two. But what we really have is an army of three. We have Jonathan, we have his armor bearer, and we have the Lord of hosts who's on their side, the captain of heaven's army is on their side, and I can only imagine what this story felt like from a pre-mortal perspective for you and me if, if we were given the chance to look down and watch certain things play out, how my heart would have just longed to have the kind of faith that Jonathan and this armor-bearer have as they look at those astronomical numbers of opposition at this steep hill between them and that opposition, and Jonathan saying, come with me, 
because the Lord is able to deliver. Now you'll notice the response of the armor bearer. I, I don't know about you, but if I were the armor bearer, I might be saying something like, really, Jonathan? Y you and me? We're going to do that? But not this armor bearer. He's filled with faith. Look at verse 7. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart, turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. I, I love this guy. I love his faith. He's, he's saying to Jonathan, whatever you do, I'm with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with you. Which, by the way, can I just say, that is a beautiful, beautiful concept, verse 7, for any who serve as counselors in a presidency. That idea of, I'm here, I'm, I'm going to sustain, I'm going to give you my, my best thinking and my best effort as we move forward to, to overcome this opposition that we're facing. So then Jonathan says, Jonathan says, here's the plan. We're hiding behind these two rocks. We're going to come out from behind the rocks. We're going to make ourselves known to the, to the guards up on the hill here. We're going to somehow get their attention. And then one of two scenarios is going to play out. They are either going to say, yo, you wait right there, we'll come, we'll come teach you a lesson. Then he said, if that's the case, we'll stand our ground and we'll let them come down to us and we'll meet them in the strength of the Lord. But then Jonathan said, option two, they might say, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. And Jonathan said, if they say that, then we will know that the Lord God of Israel has delivered the Philistines into our hand to this day. <laughs> Once again, I don't know about you, but if I were the armor bearer, I might say, ah, uh, let's think this through a little more carefully, but not this armor bearer. He tells him, uh, I'm with you. you. You do whatever you want. I'm with you. So they come out, they discover themselves under the garrison in verse 11, and the Philistines, can you picture them? Can you picture the haughtiness of this group looking at the numbers and the weaponry backing them as they look down at these two Israelites at the bottom of this steep hill waving at them, trying to get their attention, and them thinking, how quaint. And they, they shout down, come up to us and we will show you a thing. I don't know about you, but I can picture the look on Jonathan's face there. I can picture they're straining to hear what's the response going to be, and they hear that response. I can picture Jonathan looking at his armor bearer saying, did you hear what I heard? And him saying, yeah, I did. And Jonathan saying, all right, the Lord has delivered them into our hands, let's go get them. I love this phrase, come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. Now, just how steep is the hill? Look at verse 13. And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him. If you're climbing up a hill on your hands and your feet, it tells you that it's a pretty serious incline to be able to get up the hill. Now, if you're going upwards trying to fight with swords, which they are, that means Jonathan going up first can't get at the, the vital parts of the body, the head or the heart. He can't kill anyone, all he can do is knock them, knock them down knock them over. So notice what it says, he went up on his hands and his feet and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after him. So Jonathan's knocking them over and the armor bearer's then killing them. Notice verse 14 says, and that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about twenty men. Twenty men. So you take all of those numbers of the Philistines that we had below or before, and now you subtract twenty, and now you have a more a more reasonable fight, right? I can only imagine once again what this must have looked like from from our pre mortal perspective if we got to watch this play out. Watching those two struggle up the hill with gravity working against them 
with the might of the Philistines pressing down on them, and they've killed 20 men by the time they get near the top. Oh, how we must have longed to be more like that when it was our turn to come to the earth. Now, brothers and sisters, this is a really, really beautiful moment in the, in the story of the Bible where the Lord God of Israel, seeing their, their faith and their moving forward in the face of such incredible adversity and opposition, it's here where he basically says, now let me fight the battle for you. And the same Heavenly Father back then is in his heavens today, and his Son, Jesus Christ, will help us today as we face our Philistine um, odds that are totally uh, outnumbering us on so many levels. Notice it says, verse 15, there was a trembling in the host in the field, and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers, they also trembled, and the earth quaked. So it was a very great trembling. So you can picture God stepping in now and doing things that no mortal could ever do, but he's taking their acts of faith and he's now saying, now watch what I'm going to do and the ground starts shaking, the whole group is in disarray, and they start fighting themselves. We don't know if this is taking place at dusk when it's starting to get dark and people are a bit disoriented, or if they're just waking up in the morning. We don't know any of that because they don't give us a timestamp, but what we do know is the whole group in verse 16 says, the multitude melted away and they went on beating down one another. So as you face opposition, don't feel like it's your job to overcome every single element of that opposition. Sometimes all the Lord needs is for you to move onward and upward on your covenant path in faith, facing just a small handful of the opposition, knowing that those acts of faith in him can lead to much, much grander miracles down the road.